This episode was brought to you by my patrons. Your kind support truly means the world to me. It's just the excitement and the thrill, especially when you find that first bit of evidence of that footprint or you hear that vocalization. Subject Found is a series of found recordings from our extensive private collection. It contains some of the most mysterious and macabre files and recordings ever gathered, and we release them for your consideration. We do not validate their claims, but share them to allow you to make up your mind about who we are as a species and what our collective veritable truth actually is. Subject Found is a weekly audio drama. Each episode is sequential, so if you haven't listened to the earlier episodes from this season, we encourage you to do so now so you don't miss anything. Last episode, Jared Strong investigated reported sightings in Mount Rainier National Park and met with park ranger Andrew Porter. In this episode, he concludes that investigation and heads to Forks, Washington, where tourists interested in twilight lore have reported an unpleasant surprise on their trip. I really appreciate you taking me to see this. I know you probably have a ton of other things that need to get done. Eh, I blocked my entire day for the visit. Oh yeah? How'd you get away with that? Well, we do these periodic conservation inspections that take up a lot of time. I set one up for today, so he's expecting me to be out. They take forever. Want you know you didn't do it? No, not as long as I don't miss anything egregious. Plus, I'm going back out after we're done. It's gonna be a long day for you. Well, it's worth it. The change in Andrew was palpable. The park ranger I'd met only two hours ago was guarded and apprehensive, and now he almost seemed vulnerable. We made our way through winding roads, which are actually more like wide trails than anything that should be driven on. It was an uncomfortable ride, but it didn't seem to affect Andrew in the slightest. He rode the bumps and holes as if he were relaxing in a kayak on a lazy river, while I was jolted all over the small cab. The benefits of youth, I guess. The small pickup did the best it could to handle the rough path. We continued to climb for what seemed far longer than we should have needed to. As anyone who has ever driven mountain roads knows, sometimes the going is actually slower than city traffic. But that didn't take away from the beauty of the drive. Rainier dominates the landscape here. Rainier is the landscape. It's surreal. After about 30 minutes, Andrew pulled the pickup off to the side of the trail road and turned it off. And this is where we hike. Good thing I'm prepared for it. Where are we headed? Well, we're going up the trail a little bit and heading up to Anvil Rock. Isn't that quite the hike? It's nowhere near the summit, if that's what you're asking. We're not prepared for that. And we're not going exactly to Anvil Rock, just near it. We geared up and started our hike. The one definite benefit of investigating Sasquatch is that I'm in pretty decent shape for my age. Actually, I'm in very good shape for my age. The drawback? My knees are almost at the end of their usable life. Years of hiking in the backcountry of the Pacific Northwest has guaranteed me a future appointment with an orthopedic surgeon. I'm just hoping to put that off as long as I can. Andrew explained he was actually off duty when he saw the creature. His personal experience, training, and vocabulary wouldn't allow him to identify it as a Sasquatch, which actually is pretty normal. Mount Rainier is pretty barren, like most mountains. The tree line was below where we stood, and besides volcanic rock, there isn't much to the rugged landscape. I was intrigued from the beginning because of the lack of natural tree cover, but I didn't want to express that interesting tidbit and possibly discourage Andrew. The lack of natural cover didn't invalidate his experience, and I was careful not to present myself as too skeptical, especially to someone who's possibly a recent convert.
So I was right about here taking pictures of the summit. It was a beautiful day. The mountain had a few days of new snowfall and I wanted to capture it, but it was pristine and still traversable. So I covered a little more area than I'd planned. I was basically all over the face of the mountain. That's when I noticed the footprints. They came from left to right, from beyond that rock outcropping right over there. I couldn't identify what species left the prints, so I started tracking them. I was curious. Really curious. The size and depth of the prints was impressive. Deep enough to be a bear, so it was a heavy animal, but not remotely the correct shape to be one. Not even close. Why? It had... toes. My curiosity got the better of me, and even though I was feeling uneasy, I was probably within 50 yards of the outcropping when I saw it. Man, this is crazy. I get that. A lot of people still don't understand what they saw, even years after an encounter. It was a Sasquatch? Hey, look, I I'm not saying that. I don't know what it was, but it wasn't a bear, it wasn't a coyote, and it was very, very human-like. Except that it was covered in hair, and it had to be seven feet tall at least. Well, here, let me show you the tracks. Andrew showed me what remained of the tracks. Let me tell you. Time is the enemy of anyone interested in studying Sasquatch. Tracks suffer in sunny, warmer conditions, and at this elevation, without the protection of trees, tracks suffer. These particular tracks had been exposed to two days of sun and showed much worse for the wear. Ridge lines and tracks don't survive sun exposure, and these had already begun melting into themselves, distorting size and shape. That didn't make for good science and would only feed the trolls who seemed to live to debunk Sasquatch claims. It's obvious that whatever left these tracks was bipedal and large. My own tracks were going no deeper than two inches, but of course the snowpack was harder now than it would have been two days ago. These tracks? Their depth was easily six to eight inches. Whatever left them was a big boy. I took some photographs and plotted the location on my GPS tracker, thanked Andrew for his time. I would have loved to stay and learn more about his experience, but I had a long trip ahead of me. He was understanding. You can't be too careful and considerate with new converts. Seeing your first Sasquatch, especially in his field, can be traumatic, and I couldn't deny the tinge of guilt I felt at having to rush off. It was late afternoon before I got back to the parking lot outside the visitor's center. We said our farewells, and I started the long drive to Forks. Yes, that forks, the one of twilight fame. <laughs> I'm meeting someone who's actually in forks on vacation. I've got a few associates in the area, and one of them called me yesterday after a sighting by this upset tourist. It is a long drive across the western half of Washington, so I decided to give Maria a call. Is everything okay, Jared? Hi to you, too. <sighs> Sorry. I'm just... Sort of in the middle of something. Oh? What are you doing? Jared, you don't get to ask me that kind of stuff anymore. Remember? <sighs> I hadn't realized that a separation entitled us to completely distinct lives. Don't be like that. Sorry. I just didn't realize how far we'd fallen. Why are you calling? No, nothing. Never mind. It's... I need you to check in on Molly. If you could. <sighs> You're going out of town again? I'm at Rainier now, and I need to run out to Forks. Something's happened out there. I have plans tonight, Jared. You can't just drop things on me like this. Okay. Could you at least swing by and ask Mike if he could? No. I'll do it. Just... Just plan better next time. Thanks for the favor of taking care of the dog you own, too. I'll figure something out so I can stop bothering you. Okay. Listen... I didn't mean to come off as harsh. I just thought I was pretty clear with what I needed. It's crystal clear. Have a good day. 
Okay, Jared. You too. I don't know why I called her. Old habits? That or my complete failure to realize that she may have shared my excitement in the past, but the unfortunate thing about the past is that it isn't the present. Maria was supportive of my passion for years. We've been married for over ten, though the last few probably couldn't be considered much of a marriage. Early on, she'd even go out on expeditions with me, but the last few, she sort of lost any interest in it. I don't know where it started going wrong, but once it made that turn from good to bad, it got bad pretty quickly. Uh, Enough about that. Forks is an interesting town, nestled about as far west as you can get without getting wet. I was lucky getting the call when I did. There's been no rain for three days. A weird scenario in western Washington for any time of the year. If what this tourist found is legitimate, it should be in amazing condition. I was meeting this person at the visitor center, conveniently located right off the 101 in the middle of the town. There are two small buildings there, the smaller containing every bit of memorabilia of the Twilight series that can possibly be crammed into 600 square feet, which is funny considering the movies were never filmed here. Just don't let anyone know I told you that. I'm pretty sure the economy of Forks depends on that tidbit of bad information, and the locals probably wouldn't appreciate me educating you on that. I was going to head there to inquire about this tourist. I pulled through the wide parking lot and noticed their RV, a newer model Tiffin Allegro, parked along the ditch off to the side of the parking lot. By the sheer size of what they were traveling in, I'm sure parking it that way made egress much easier. This thing was immense. I often wondered what type of person spends the small fortune necessary to own a vehicle of this size who can also afford the expensive gasoline required to move it. I soon found out. Frank Hollenbeck could be described as a portly man. In his early 70s, Frank had thick arms that still showed signs of muscle that men half his age had lost long ago. Only his belly, gray hair, and edged facial creases betrayed the fact that time had caught up and overcome his physical prowess. By all indications, though, Frank wasn't going down without a fight. He greeted me with a grandfatherly smile and crushing handshake before inviting me into his RV. Hey, nice to meet you, son. His wife Dorothy was making an early dinner at the stove. She also greeted me as if I were a grandchild they hadn't seen in years before returning to the stove to rescue the meal. I had no idea what she was talking about. The smell of the chicken cacciatore she was preparing made my mouth water, and I'd already eaten. That was a feat not many cooks could pull off. Now I understood how an obviously healthy man like Frank had gained a comparably healthy stomach. You get up here often? Well, yeah, this time of year, we make it a point. We come up through Oregon, do the loop around the Olympics, head back across the border. Ah, Vancouver. Beautiful city. It is. We thought of living up there about 20 years ago, but changed our minds once we experienced a November day. Dorothy said, if this is what November's like, I don't want any business in the city during January. Couldn't blame her, to be honest. I was sort of relieved. My my bones, don't they don't take too kindly to cold. <laughs> so summer trips only? Uh, once in a while, I would do a spring or a fall trip as well, depending on the weather. It's gorgeous here at those times, too. If you catch the weather off the ocean on a good day, you know? That can change in an instant. So, talk to me about this sighting you had. My associate said it seemed urgent, like you had to have this conversation before you left town. Is this really going to be on the radio? Never been on the radio. Well, sort of. I'm going to publish it on a podcast, sort of like radio, just over the internet. But yes, it'll be available around the world. Hear that, Dorothy? Around the world. My grandkids are going to love this. I'm not quite sure how or where to start. We're out by Eaton Creek, just north of Bogasio. River outside of town, just off 101. We're doing some day hiking. We can't do as much as we used to anymore, but we save up our bad joints for times when we can get up there. So we really enjoy it. Though we really only hike mostly flat terrain. 
We'll pay for it for weeks afterwards, but damn it. You gotta get one trip on this rock, isn't that right? Might as well enjoy it while you're here. As it was, we was about a mile or so up the creek, and I had to stop to relieve myself. It happens a lot more at this age, you trust me. So Dorothy took the chance to rest her knees and stayed up on the bank while I went down to the water. To, well, you know, you get the idea. Well, I was just about done with my business. Then I heard a splash off to my left. It scared the dickens out of me. Ain't nothing funny about a man in that position being scared by some animal. Being vulnerable like that and all. I looked up the bank toward where I heard the sound come from and... Man, I saw it. Saw what? My kids are going to say I'm senile. But I know what I saw. I looked down that river, and I swear as I'm seeing you right now, I saw a large animal running across to that riverbank. Thought it was a man at first. It looked like a man. It was all covered in hair. Every inch of its body. And you're positive it wasn't a man. Or, or a bear. Sir, I wouldn't have gone through the trouble finding someone like you for a bear. Definitely not for some man. I know what I saw. Mr. Holland. Frank, just Frank, please. Okay, Frank, please understand. I don't doubt you. I've seen things myself that I can't explain. I know what the experience is like, and I know that things aren't necessarily always what they appear to be, no matter how convinced we are by them. I'm just eliminating possibilities so I can focus my investigation. I don't mean to imply more. I understand that. I do. Let me tell you, it wasn't easy to go around asking for an expert. I'm a proud man. Too proud sometimes. But this... This shook me. I don't know what it was for sure. But I do know that it wasn't a man. It wasn't a bear. Weren't a dog, a coyote, or deer. I'm telling you, it was upright. Bigfoot. <laughs> Funny name, isn't it? Probably doesn't help you much. What do you mean? As far as, you know, lending any credibility to the beast. How'd that name come about? Who in their right mind thought that was a good idea? <laughs> well, look, I, I don't want to bore you with the details of the history of Sasquatch. Consider it entertaining an old man. I'm genuinely interested in hearing about it. You already know I'm not as skeptical as I was a few days ago. In that case, I'm happy to answer your questions if I can. The name? Sasquatch goes all the way back to the 1920s. A Canadian journalist, J.W. Burns, decided there should be a common term of reference for the species. At that time, it had various names across the Native American tribes, and he thought one name to reference would facilitate examining its history. Seriously? That far? Yeah, but... Bigfoot is more recent, for what that's worth, like around the late 1950s. A construction crew in Northern California kept coming across tracks all over a site where they were clearing forest land for new roads. They'd work throughout the day without incident and then come back in the morning to find fresh, unrecognizable prints all around their equipment. The tracks were huge, too, 16 inches. So, big foot because of the size of them footprints. Makes sense. 16 inches, though? I tell you, I think I might have found you something close to that. Really? You measured? Nope. Got myself out there as quickly as I could. But I'm telling you, they're huge. I still got half a mind to avoid that place, to be honest. But you're still willing to take me? I can. Dorothy... She ain't going back. I don't really want to, but it just doesn't feel right pulling out of town and leaving what I found where I found it. Someone smart, someone like you, needs to see it. Why's that? It'll be the only way I can convince myself that I ain't going senile. So this is where you were standing when you saw it. 
right here. And it crossed over there. Frank pointed to an area a hundred yards up the creek bed. It was a wide but shallow creek. The water moved swiftly downstream, but in some spots it was no more than 10 feet across, easily traversable by man and beast. A tree leaned out over the water at a sharp angle, looking ready to tip over any moment. This is the area where Frank said he saw the creature. You able to cross with me? I'm old. I ain't invalid. <laughs> That's not what I meant. Sorry. I I'd like to check the bank over there to see if we can see anything. Oh, we will. What is it you do? Do you get paid to do this? <laughs> not well. This is it. This is my job. Really? Yep. And you make a living at this? No, not a good one, but there are ways for you to make money off hunting Sasquatch. Some people make a lot of money doing it, but they tend to be less scrupulous. I prefer to do honest, serious work. Why am I not surprised that less than scrupulous people would even get involved in this? They could take advantage of anything, won't they? Over there is where I saw them. See? Jesus. Sir, there ain't nothing holy about them footprints. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The prints were well preserved. It didn't appear anyone had traipsed through the area since Frank was here last. Some of the prints were useless because they were too close to the waterline, but up on the bank, there were a number of incredible prints. I could see at least six I could cast careful to keep myself and Frank far enough away as to not disturb the prince, I stood and followed them into the tree line where the underbrush made progress slow. It was so thick that many of the tracks were difficult to find. Whatever had come through here did so in a hurry, knocking over and trampling the brush, essentially destroying any chance I had to collect usable evidence. I'm about a hundred yards in now. I've lost all usable evidence. The tracks are now indistinct due to the amount of vegetation that's been knocked over and matted. This doesn't make sense. No matter how big this thing was, it couldn't have disrupted the vegetation to the extent I was seeing now. The destruction is too expansive. Maybe it drugged something alongside it. A deer? Uh, that couldn't be. Frank didn't mention the Sasquatch carrying or dragging anything, and the rest of the tracks didn't show this wide berth I was looking at now. Unless what I was seeing had come from the other direction. I carefully hurried forward, but quickly got discouraged. The matted underbrush spread out even wider just a few feet ahead of me. I was now losing time, chasing bad evidence, but I did have the footprints on the bank, a few that would be great for casting. I'm about to turn around and head back to the river so I can... What's that? There's a wall of tall Pacific wax myrtle and just beyond it what looks like... Oh, God. I'm looking at the lair of the beast. I asked Frank to stay by the river while I followed these tracks through the underbrush. And I'm glad I did because he'd probably think I'm an idiot by the way I'm reacting to what I'm looking at now. All of this was starting to make a lot of sense. As scary as that is to think about... The underbrush I followed looked trampled because it was a well-worn path, probably used daily. I'm confident of it because I've just stumbled into the beast's home. I'm staring at a Bigfoot nest. I'm standing on the edge of a clearing of matted deer fern. A circle about 50 feet in diameter has been laid flat by traffic and, and a body or bodies. It's apparent something walks through here often and most likely even sleeps here. Off to my right are remains of what looks like a raccoon spread across a small area. The remains look relatively fresh, killed within the last few days. One thing I do know, someone or something lives here. 
I've got to get pictures of this. I, 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 I don't feel well. Nauseous, dizzy. Might be my nerves. I can't help but feel like I'm being watched. I couldn't explain it then, and I can't now as I record this hours later. It was a feeling I'd sensed before, a feeling many Bigfoot investigators have described feeling, and it was something I wanted to remove myself from as quickly as possible. By fleeing, I was acting on instinct, not rationality. I can't hate myself for that. It took the entire walk back to the river to clear my fuzzy head. Thankfully, Frank didn't see me like that. The last thing I wanted was to give him a reason to doubt me or his own sanity. By the time I reached the river, I think I put forth a convincing act of calmness, though I did catch him examining me when he thought I wasn't looking. I set about quickly making casts of the tracks I knew I could grab good samples from as Frank looked on and asked questions about the history of Sasquatch. He wondered if these footprints looked faked, like all the other examples and stories he'd heard for years. It's a legitimate consideration, one I always go into investigations with on the forefront of my mind. I am not a knower by any stretch of the imagination. I prefer to keep a healthy balance between blind faith and equally blind skepticism. I have no idea how good of a job I'm doing with either of those, but looking at my personal life, I can't fault anyone for giving me a failing grade. I shared my perspective about con artists, and I think I convinced him that what he found wouldn't make him look like a crazy man, which seemed to be a very real concern of his. Being associated in any way with Bigfoot can do that to people. One of the greater shames of a judgmental society, in my opinion. We'll get into that more next time. I'll be honest, I wasn't sure what to expect from Frank or from Forks, which isn't renowned for its sightings. And it's definitely not known for providing evidence of nests. Glad I decided to check this out. Funny, isn't it? That a non-believer turned convert might have helped me stumble upon something that might change the course of my investigations for good. Subject Found is a pulsating production in association with Fate Crafter Studios. All quotes that you hear at the beginning of each episode are provided by Steve Mojo Wilkins of the Washington Sasquatch Research Team. You can find more of Steve's work over at WASRT.net. And I would like to thank Steve for his time on educating me on what it's like to find Bigfoot. This episode was written and edited by Paul Sading. It was produced by Brian Bristol. Join us in episode four as Jared wraps up his visit with Frank Hollenbeck in the nest in Forks, Washington, before heading to Quinault for an overnighter that poses problems for him and the future of his investigation. Be sure to join us. If you have sightings you would like to report, please email us at foundtapespodcast at gmail.com and we'll get it into Jared's hands. For more information on the show to include how you can actually support the show, head over to foundstories.com. Patrons get early access to content, exclusive bonus content, and patrons will get alternate ending options at the end of this first season. Jared Strong is played by John McClain. You can find John's work at jmacvo.com and over at dogandponystudios.net. Maria Strong is played by Heather Spiegel Auden. David Curry plays Andrew Porter. You can find David on his YouTube channel, This Atheist Life, and on Atheist Apocalypse Podcast. Frank Hollenbeck is our producer, Brian Bristol. You can find Brian's other amazing work on You Are Here Sci-Fi Podcast and also on Atheist Apocalypse. Music in this episode was created by Chris Collins at IndieMusicBox.com. Yin vs. Yang at SoundCloud.com forward slash Yin vs. Yang. And Tabletop Audio at TabletopAudio.com. All music was licensed and used with permission. If you would like to become a patron of Subject Found so that we can continue to investigate this season's lost tapes and provide you even more newly discovered tapes in the future by going over to patreon.com forward slash Paul Sading. P-A-U-L-S-A-T-I-N-G. That's patreon.com forward slash Paul Sading. 
I would like to take a second to thank the four new patrons of the shows. Because remember, if you patron Subject Bound, you also are supporting Diary of a Madman and any future audio drama creations, anthology stories that I have for you. Those four wonderful new patrons are Scott, off of Audio Oblivious Productions, hashtag Eagle Screech. Go check them out if you have not already. Their Winnebago Warrior series is absolute genius. Also, Tara, Inez, and Sandy. To the four of you, I thank you very much for your support. It's humbling and it's greatly appreciated that you would take a little bit of time and your own hard-earned money to keep this show going on air free to everyone. Thank you, thank you. We also have a Reddit page for the show now. Subreddit is subject found, so go out there if you are a Reddit user and go find us, go subscribe to it, stay in closer touch with the show. I would like to thank Yashvi who stepped up to help me moderate that subreddit. You may know her from Twitter fame at that podcast girl so yashvi thank you very much for that help to everyone who does use reddit go on out there and subscribe to it i'd love to meet you out there and chat with you about the show there and hear about some of the things that you may have found lastly go over to our site foundstories.com and find out how you can subscribe to the show and where you can leave a rating and review those five star ratings and reviews go a long way to helping this show be found. Speaking of, until next episode, all that is lost must be found.